So, and welcome uh, this morning here in the Dumpf Dome. After our uh, great first talk, we now switch to English. And um, yeah, I would like to welcome and introduce Dan Nebe from Marble Fusion, a, a Munich-based company. Um, and with his talk, Fusion Energy, a game changer for the future of energy. Um, Dan obtained his bachelor's in physics and a master's degree in management from the TU Munich and then um, switched into venture capital where he uh, focused on investments in uh, software as a service startups. And in 2020, he joined Marvel Fusion and is now the vice president of operations. Um, uh, goes to the relations to their business partners and um, oversees some research they do there. And uh, in his talk, he will talk about Germany's energy situation and how Marvel Fusion uh, aims to use laser-based fusion to bring clean energy to the market. Um, and with this, please uh, welcome with me Dan here on the stage. Hello everyone, nice to see so many faces uh, and first of all, thank you very much for, for TNG Consulting uh, for hosting that beautiful Big Tech Day and for inviting me to be able to speak today um, and I really want to continue with uh, what my prior speaker started talking about which is storytelling and I want to today take you on uh, a story of human progress and hopefully um, convey to you that we are on the verge of the next step in human progress. What is human progress about? It's really about energy. If you look at it, roughly a million years ago, humanity discovered the fire. The fire was a source of warmth and light it helped protect from predators. It was a useful tool to create new tools to work. Um, but most importantly, it allowed humanity to untether from caves, but really explore the world. It took roughly a couple of hundred thousands of years to explore the next denser energy source, which was the steam engine powered by coal, discovered in the mid-1700s, really led to the next wave of industrialization, uh, helped a lot in increasing productivity, right? Obviously, this was significantly more productive than a couple of horses and much easier to use. And it really increased not just economic prosperity, but also sanitation and a lot of other things that humanity is about. Now, since then, really the last 250 years, what has enabled the next wave on this in industrialization is still coal and petroleum. And for the last 250 years, everyone in this room, I think, is aware we have used that quite a bit. And with that, obviously, comes a lot of toxic carbon dioxide emissions and some of the problems that we face today. So the question is a little bit, what is next to enable a bright future? And certainly, um, we are facing a problem today, right? It's not just about the emissions, but also Germany, as uh, I was introduced, but not just Germany, Europe and the whole world is facing a huge energy problem. Um, if you look at the industrialization, there is a huge endangerment, especially if you look at Europe um, for industrial sites. BASF is paying two billion per year for electricity and gas and really looks into uh, going away from Germany due to high energy prices. There is a replacement needed for energy infrastructure. If you look at France, uh, 
I think 90% of their power plants are 30 years and older nuclear power plants. Um, so they will need to replace that infrastructure in the coming decades. And at the same time, we face that challenge of decarbonization, right? And decarbonization often means to a lot of, to a big degree, electrification. So we will see an enormous increase in electricity need. If you just look at Germany, we are currently needing 580 terawatt hours uh, that we use of electricity per year. If you only look at the chemical industry, the decarbonization until 2050, they will need an additional 630 terawatt hours. That alone doubles the electricity usage just in Germany, just for the chemical industry. So we really need to find a solution to find enough supply of green energy um, to face or manage that decarbonization. Obviously, renewables will play a big part of that, but they will not reach the scale required, especially in a country like Germany, to solve this problem on its own. And I want to today convey you that there is a solution or a potential solution that will come along, not tomorrow, but also not in 30 years. And that's fusion. Um, fusion is, as we say, nature's choice of energy. Um, you all know it's the power that, uh, or the energy that powers the stars. And it's sort of the, the dream come true if we make it happen, right? It's super clean, it has no emissions, it's safe, it's basically what nuclear fission is about, um, which is the opposite. It splits atoms, we fuse them. Um, it has the same energy density, but it doesn't come with the downsides. There's no meltdown risk, and there's no long-lasting radioactive waste. So there's no toxic material going in and no toxic material going out, making it a perfect candidate to build plants near highly energy-dense industrial sites, but also residential buildings. It's inexhaustible, as we say, and that's really the beauty of nuclear energy. If you look at what type of resources we need to produce power, it's incredible. So a gigawatt power plant, roughly the size of a nuclear power plant today or a big coal plant, requires 500 kilograms of fuel per year to run basically 24-7. If you look at the coal power plant, it needs 2 million tons. So that's a few or quite a few of trains of coal versus a little bit of fuel. And that's really the beauty, right? And obviously, current nuclear energy comes with a lot of downsides, but fusion does not have them. Now, it obviously needs to work technically, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it also needs to be affordable, because ultimately, it all sounds nice, but if we don't hit the price that the market requires, also fusion won't change anything. And this is really an important thing that I think everyone needs to think about, and something that Marvel Fusion has very close to its heart, and a few design choices that I will talk about later were purposely made to make this affordable and competitive in the market. How do we do fusion? There's a number of different approaches, and I will go into them later, but we'll first talk about laser fusion. Um, you can see a laser here. Um, we are using ultra-fast, ultra-intense lasers. What does that mean? And you will see fusion is really about extremes, right? We go into all sorts of extremes to make this happen. Ultra-fast means femtoseconds. That's a billionth of a millionth of a second. It's basically how long does the light travel in one second, in one femtosecond? That's roughly the thickness of your hair. So it's super short. It's also super intense. We focus the power, which is petawatts. So that's the opposite, 10 to the 15. It's a billion times a million uh, onto micron scale. 
petawatt is really more power than the entire installed capac power capacity on Earth. And we really focus that on a very tiny spot. And that tiny spot is what we call the fuel targets. It's basically a small pellet that contains the fuel that we want to fuse. In our case, these are nanostructured. Again, a billionth of a meter, that's the scale on which we structure these targets. And the picture behind me is an actual picture of a target. So we call them nano rods or nano wires. It's basically cylinders on the nanometer scale. And I will talk about why they need to be nanostructured. But again, the big advantage here is that this is processes that are used in the semiconductor industry and it really helps us scale the production of this. What does this special approach enable? It has a number of key advantages. One is that we can tailor the particle acceleration. Uh, and I was told this is a tacky, um, tacky audience, so we will go a little bit into what that actually means and why we need it. Um, but in a nutshell, we can really tailor how fast these particles that we accelerate are, where they go, and how we make them fuse. The second advantage is really that we can bypass a lot of the fusion problems. And we will come to that throughout the talk, back and forth. But what has really hindered fusion so far is inefficiencies, right? Energy gain, getting more energy out than putting in, was a problem for a long time and still is to some degree. Um, and this is mainly due to instabilities. You can think about it. A good example is always a tomato soup, as we like to say. So for fusion to happen, you need to make something hot enough, dense enough, for long enough, right? And if you heat up a tomato soup, all your kitchen uh, walls know that if there's no lid on it, at some point, you know, it will start exploding and bubble and so on. And these are really an analogon on, of the instabilities that we face in fusion, right? Especially, uh, it's, I think, more visible for these large donut-shaped plasmas. At some point, there is disruptions, but the same holds true for that laser-based approach. And we will talk a little bit about why we can avoid them, but this is a key enabler of more efficiency. And lastly, this goes really into the reason or the, the ultimate criteria that this needs to be affordable is the use of proton boron 11. This is, you know, another extreme. Um, we talked about hot enough. Typically, the traditional way um, that people do fusion is using deuterium tritium. Tritium is radioactive, both are isotopes of hydrogen. The thing why people use this is it needs only 150 million degrees. Still, you know, 10 times more hotter than the center of the sun, but manageable. Proton boron 11, traditionally a little bit more difficult, billion degrees. So this in itself is obviously a huge challenge. Now, if you look at what temperature actually is, you can get a little bit better feeling about this, right? Because temperature ultimately is an average distribution of particle velocities. And the hotter it is, the faster they are. Now, with temperature, you always have an average and a broad distribution. So you have many particles that are much faster, many particles that are much slower, and only a few particles that are in the right range to have a high fusion probability. If you can tailor that distribution so that there is only particles where you want them to be at the spot, you can already do or gain a lot of efficiencies. And the energies that you actually need for these particles, they are not a lot. We are talking in kilo electron volts. So 1,000 electron volts. What you can reach with laser-based particle acceleration is giga electron volts, a million times more. 
Now, obviously, you don't need to just accelerate one particle, but you can easily reach the scale. Now, just one more word on why PB11 is the best commercial fuel if you can solve the technical challenges. The fusion reaction is behind me. You fuse a proton with a boron-11. Boron-11 is an isotope of boron. It occurs naturally. 80% of boron is actually boron-11. And the beauty of it is it creates three alpha particles, positively charged helium ions as fusion products. Now, the big problem that no one talks about in fusion is that actually the other fuels produce highly energetic neutrons and they brittle your target chamber. They can be used to breed nuclear material. And in general, they just cause a lot of costs in operating that. Now, if you have three alpha particles, they are already charged. You can actually guide them to where you want them to decrease the load on the target chamber. And you can even directly convert them through inductive measures and therefore increase efficiency. Ultimately, what that means is you have easier supply since this occurs in nature versus tritium that needs to be breeded, bred, uh, and you have much less cost in operating and maintaining the power plant. And I want to say that up front before we now go into how we actually accelerate particles, because this is a fundamental part of our, our hypothesis, something that is certainly debated, but a firm belief of us. Now, how do we actually make this? And this is obviously a bit of an artistic picture, but I think it conveys the message well. As we said, we use ultra-short laser pulses. They approach this target, and the target is really what I said, nanowires. So here we show two nanowires. The laser is the transparent disk. It approaches them, and then it propagates in between these nanowires. And these lasers, again, an extreme, have such a high pressure. You can compare it if you take the Eiffel Tower, you take it upside down and you put it on your fingertip. That's roughly the pressure that a laser can apply. And with that pressure, it just takes away the electrons. So you have atoms, it just strips away all electrons and ionizes the material. And what it leaves behind is positively charged structures. Now, as you still all know from school physics, positive things repel each other, right? So this is due to the Coulomb force. It's actually also why fusion is so difficult, because you need to overcome that Coulomb barrier to fuse particles. But we make actually use of it in the first place because if you have only positively charged structures, they explode, as we say. We call it Coulomb explosion. They repel each other, and particles are being accelerated. And this is a super efficient mechanism to convert that initial energy, really to kickstart that process, the entire energy is in the laser, right? There's no other energy. And we strip away the electrons and accelerate particles. And they have a lot of kinetic energy. And it's a very co efficient conversion mechanism of that laser energy into kinetic ion energy. And if you recall what I said in the beginning about temperature, you need a lot of particles that are very fast. So they have a lot of kinetic energy. And with this process, we can really manage to get a lot of particles very fast, easily in the MeV to gig, uh, giga electron volt range, way beyond the fusion cross-section maximum, so the probability. But we can tailor it. And that's really the important point. Through structuring these wires, making them a little bit bigger, making them further apart or thinner, debating how the laser should be, we can really tailor how these rods explode and therefore really have a very efficient process to initiate that fusion reaction. This is really at the center of why we can make PB11 work, because this is fundamentally 
much more efficient than as we call the brute force approach, where you simply heat something up and you hope that a few of these particles have the right velocity to actually fuse. Now, this is simply, you know, the one-time process to produce energy. But as some of you might know, doing this once doesn't create you a power plant yet. Um, not so much energy comes out out of one process. What you need to do to run a power plant is do that 10 times per second. So you actually need to run this 900,000 times per day, every day, for the whole year to produce a gigawatt. And this is the components that you need for that. You have a laser, as we said, and you have a target. And then you have a target chamber in which this whole reaction happens. And as I said, it doesn't just happen once, but you really fire that target in there every tenth of a second. So you need to have quite some speed. And then you need to have micron, uh, micrometer um, precision to actually hit it in the way that you need to. And this needs to happen all the time, automated. And then you actually need to convert that fusion output into electricity. And there's a couple of ways to do that. One is the classical thermal way of doing it, the base case for all fusion companies. All of these particles fire into a wall, heat up the wall. There's a heat exchanger. You can do the steam cycle and you get electricity. Efficiencies are around 50%, probably good enough for the start. But we have the big advantage, as I said earlier, that we can also convert these charged particles by guiding them through an externally applied magnetic field and directly converting them into energy, reaching efficiencies of 70, maybe up to 80%. Now, this all sounds great, uh, and I know this is what all of you have in mind. Nuclear fusion sounds awesome. Uh, we've been told that since our childhood. It's always 30 years away and always will be. Or will it? And that's the question. Um, and I'm here to tell you why it will not. Uh, I'm a firm believer that we will see that this works and that there's a clear prototype within the next 10 years. And there's a number of reason, reasons uh, why fusion is now. One certainly is scientific breakthroughs. There has been a lot of research and there have been a number of scientific breakthroughs in the recent years that really make this now mainly an engineering challenge. At the same time, there has been enormous technical progress that we can leverage. And last but not least, and very importantly, finally investors and the public also wake up and start to support fusion to a level that this can really become reality. Most namely in the scientific breakthroughs is certainly energy gain was reached, at least on the target side, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. But at the National Ignition Facility in the US, at the Lawrence Livermore Lab, at the end of last year, scientists finally managed to get more energy out than they put into the target. So they fired the laser, or in their case, actually 192 laser beams onto the target and got more energy out than was in the laser pulse. This was a huge thing because fundamentally it proved that if you make something hot enough, dense enough, for long enough, you actually get more energy out than you put in. And this is, you know, fundamentally validating all the models that the physicists have come up and it's super important. Now, what I need to say, of course, is it was not energy gain for the system level, right? And it's something people point out, and rightly so, because the laser was super inefficient. The target cost 100,000 and took seven months to, to be made, and all sorts of other inefficiencies. 
So while it was a super important physics milestone, there is quite a bit to do on the technical side, and this facility was really not meant to produce net gain, but really only show that physics progress. Now, one more point I want to make, if you compare the different approaches pursuing fusion, if you look at that graph, and this is, you know, a very famous metric to measure fusion, which is the triple product, the three things I mentioned, and it's a good way to measure progress towards where we want to be. And you look at what is uh, the NIF here, it's kind of the lightish blue. Um, you see that inertial fusion really started much later than the other approaches in terms of actually doing research on this, but very quickly overtook the other approaches. And that's really the beauty of laser-based fusion and a part of why I think we can be much faster to market is you have a laser, but you can vary the targets. You don't need to build billion-dollar infrastructure every time to really make a leap in progress because the plasma physics is not married to the device, but it's decoupled from laser to target. You can iterate much faster together with all of the technology approaches, but you don't need to build a 10-year lead time infrastructure every time. And this really enables you to make a lot of progress in a very fast time. Now, next to scientific progress, there is a lot of exponential innovation in different enabling technologies. For us, obviously, the name of the game is laser technology. I already talked about all the extremes uh, that we have here, femtoseconds, petawatt, and so on. This has really been enabled through a Nobel Prize that was awarded in 2018, Gérard Mourou and Donna Strickland. Gérard Mourou, a very close ally and, and chairman of our scientific board, they invented the chirped pulse amplification. It basically enables you to go to these very high power levels without destroying the entire optics of the laser. And this was a super important invention, but it's not just that we can reach the technical parameters. And even though this is a technical conference, I want to stress that point again. It's also the economics. If you look at the laser system, the diodes, so a bit of the energy that was pumped into the laser to re reach these extreme conditions, they have seen an exponential cost decrease. So we are now really at a level where these lasers can not only be built, but they are also economic enough to really build a power plant with it. And if I talk about laser, that's maybe a laser that you know. It's like a little laser pointer. I just thought I, I show you a bit of a picture how they currently look like. This is really the sort of lasers that we talk about. They are now scientific lasers, so they are huge machines. The biggest one, I would say, or a very large one, is actually in Romania. It's a European project. It's called Extreme Light Infrastructure and Nuclear Physics. It has 10 petawatts. That's kind of, for us, the biggest thing, and we're all very excited about it. We're going to shoot there in June, uh, in January. But this fills like the entire hall here. That's roughly the laser system that they have. And what we are aiming to do, and already have a design and started building, is putting all of that into a box that's much smaller than this stage. And it will even be much more efficient and more reliable. And that's really the next step. But we can do that now. The second is computing power. I think something I don't need to stress in this room. Um, it's still something that is important to us because you can now run simulations that are much more accurate than anything we've seen before, and that simply hasn't been possible before. The last one is material science, and this is really ultimately what I talked about for the targets. We can now create these structures at a very high precision, at the nanometer scale, reliable and cost-effective. And that has really been driven a lot by the semiconductor industry, who are obviously very well versed also in producing masses of this. And as I said earlier, 
we need 900,000 targets per day. If you calculate that for a year and then you go for many power plants, we need mass production. And this is also something that is fundamental. Now, the last thing, as I mentioned, is funding. Another extreme, another exponential curve um, that enables this. And if you look at the private funding, there's really an enormous inflow of funding. Uh, the last, or 21, 22, was really significantly more funding than anything we've seen before. But at the same time now, especially since the NIF announcement, the public is also doing a lot. The US is still by far the leader here. They have all sorts of fusion programs. They also have the so-called bold decade revision, where they say they want to show that fusion works in 10 years. But they have a lot of funding programs and public-private partnerships where they saw, hey, now the majority of private fusion startups is actually in the US. Let's make use and let's make this a reality. But also Germany, actually, uh, very recently um, announced quite a bit, uh, most namely the Sprint funding of 90 million for infrastructure for laser-driven fusion, uh, which we will be a significant part of and build the lasers that we just mentioned. Sprint is the agency for disruptive innovation. Um, but also Germany actually announced a strategy for laser-driven IFE, which was a very big thing because traditionally only magnetic confinement fusion has been researched or funded in Germany. And now, really, we see the government backing this approach based on the progress we made. Also, the UK is very big. They have a fusion cluster where they support a lot of different companies. So you really see many different countries realizing this will be a reality and it won't take 30 years. This is a, a world map um, just to give you a sense that you know, it's not just us out there, uh, crazy people trying to make fusion happen. It is actually quite a few startups now um, that are trying to do that. We're roughly at 50, but what we also see is the majority is in the US. And certainly, we have to catch up here. More and more startups are being funded, but Europe needs to step up, so we are very glad that this public funding support is now being launched, and we hope that Europe doesn't lose track um, for this important technology in the coming decades. As I told you, there are a number of different approaches, and since this is a general fusion talk, I wanted to show you a little bit what's out there and how fusion can be made. Hap Magnetic confinement fusion, certainly the one uh, that is, you know, has the most history, I would say. Um, it uses superconducting magnets to con confine a plasma. We typically say the tokamak is like a donut, right? You have a plasma that's donut shaped. And as I said earlier, there's different ways to make fusion happen. In this case, the density is not so high, but they confine it for much longer times. So what we do, it takes picoseconds to nanoseconds, so a billions or even less um, of a second until the whole process is over. This is why we need to fire so many targets. They have a very long process. They confine the plasma for several minutes, and that's why they need less density. There's also magneto-inertial fusion that's sort of a mix. They you know, confine it a little bit with magnets and then they compress it. Uh, so it's yeah, somewhat a mix and the parameters are also in the middle. And then there's inertial fusion. And within inertial fusion, there is also a number of different approaches. What you see at the top right is the approach that NIF is taking, the National Ignition Facility. And you can maybe see a little bit. Let's see if uh, this works. Oh, yeah. There we go. Um, so that's this one. And you can see that the laser is going into what's called a Hohlraum cavity. It's sort of a, a gold cylinder. And the laser is first converted into X-rays. So different wavelengths, still light. But these X-rays then 
hit the fuel target and compress it to the densities and temperatures needed. Now, that initial conversion step that's needed for their specific approach already has an efficiency of 1%. So this is very difficult um, in terms of commercializing because you need to ultimately uh, compensate for all of these inefficiencies. This is why we use the direct drive approach where we directly irradiate the target um, and we have a number of different advantages that I think we could go into uh, maybe after the talk if you're interested in all the physics details. Um, this is where we are now. Um, we are the most advanced laser fusion company out there. Uh, we've raised 110 million, are now 70 people after four years, and we shot roughly 2,000 experiments. Now, it's not just us to try to tackle such a big topic, right? Ultimately, we are 70 people, but we are 70 people. So we can't really build a power plant with 70 people. This is why we heavily rely on the industrial side, on someone like Thales, a laser builder, or someone like Siemens Energy to help us scope out what building a power plant actually means and building it. And also on the scientific side, we collaborate with different universities, different individuals from universities. The Munich ones are on here, but also some American ones. What's the timeline? Uh, obviously, everyone asks, and as I, I promised you, um, it's not going to be 30 years away. So we are now at a stage where we have validated a lot of the key physics drivers that I talked about today, namely, how does the laser couple into the target? How does it propagate there? How is the ionization working? How does the Coulomb explosion work? And all sorts of these things. We simulated them, but we also used existing laser infrastructure to experimentally validate that this can work. And these lasers have the technical parameters that we need, but as I mentioned earlier, they are not efficient or compact or anything like that for a power plant, but they can very well be used for experimental validation. And that's, again, the beauty of our approach, that we can use this existing infrastructure without having to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into our own laser in the very first step, but produce targets that fit these laser parameters and actually run experiments that make sense. We are currently starting to build these industrial lasers to put them into our own facility where we run further experiments and simulations to optimize our target design to find a design that's suitable for the commercial power plant. We plan to have that next year while we continue running experiments and most importantly, as an important next step for us, build our technology demonstrator. This will be in 2026. It will host two of the lasers I mentioned. They are in the petawatt class. They already shoot 10 times per second. They will be 15% efficient compared to the NIF lasers that are less than 1% efficient. So they really have all the, the properties that we need to build a commercial power plant with them afterwards. And this will also enable us to show the scaling of the physics, further validating our models, to then go for the big shot. And that's really a prototype plant that will not only host two lasers, but rather hundreds of them. And all of them will need to be synchronized at the same spot or roughly the same spot, shooting at the same time at a target that flies in at hundreds meters per second um, and then need to produce energy. Now, this is obviously I would say one of the key challenges, right? I also want to say, of course, we are very confident we can do that, especially with the money that is now coming in. As we think fundamentally, this is an engineering challenge. And as we say, science, that's one or zero. It works or it doesn't. 
engineering, it's just a function of money and time. So uh, we, we firmly believe that if enough money goes into this, we can make it happen, but certainly the engineering challenges are enormous. Now, I want to end with, with what I started today. And this is really, if we make this a reality, this is how the future might look like. In a bright world where humanity has solved its energy problem and we really be able to advance to the next level, which would be energy abundance. It will not just, just solve the global energy problem, which is obviously core and close to my heart and our very first purpose, but it will serve a lot of additional use cases that no one can even imagine, but also some that people already work on that just require a lot of energy. Desalination, for example, right? The water problem will be a huge problem in the coming decades. Could be solved with enough cheap energy. You could produce as much hydrogen as you want. Even for the space enthusiasts, space propulsion is something that is used as a use case a lot for laser-driven fusion, because on a very small space, you can get a thrust that's significantly higher to anything that you currently do. So we actually think the only solution for Musk to go to Mars is laser-driven fusion, but that's maybe um, for another talk. And there's a lot of other use cases that we cannot even think about. And I really want to convey this optimism that there are technological innovations that can make such a future happen, especially for, I think, the Gen Zs uh, close to my generation that have a lot of pessimism and German angst. I think the future is bright and we want to solve these pressing challenges today. Let's make it happen. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dan, for this great presentation. Um, you maybe already saw the, uh, the call for questions in Slack, so um, just fire them. But first, I want to go to the audience. Are there any questions? And I see the... Yeah. Okay, then... I... Hey, thank you. That sounds uh, very interesting and promising. Um, I'm thinking, though, about something I read from Professor Stefan Ramsdorf who said maybe this is not a long-term solution for uh, our climate change because you basically transform with fusion mass to energy, so to heat, right? And if uh, we only take a tenfold increase in energy usage from what we do today, and you said, I think we're growing 2% per year or something, um, then in a few decades, we will be there at those uh, tenfold increase. And um, then fusion energy would contribute about uh, 0.3 degrees to uh, global warming. So what are your thoughts on that? Will uh, fusion energy really be a solution to that then? Can you rephrase it? You mean we are heading for a tenfold increase in energy demand? Energy demands? consumption, yes. In, okay. and if you, that if, in if itself, I, I think, is, would be a big challenge if that holds true. I think current yeah, maybe, estimates maybe are 50%. Maybe in 50, 50 or 100 years, you know? But okay. I'm thinking yeah. long term, and, and mm -hmm. this might take a few decades to materialize, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm worrying, might this be a temporary solution only? Because if um, it really, yeah, we're converting mass to heat here. And to electricity, it, right? The heat doesn't get out, right? It's a closed system, and we actually directly convert it into electricity. There's no heat creation. Well, in Very the end, little residual uh, in the end, warm that the warm circles energy off. Will, be, will be preserved here, right? Some mm. will, of course, be go to the universe somewhere, but uh, a lot of it will stay on Earth. So I, I'm not an expert in this. I just read what they're saying and say, okay, if we really scale this up, um, this might be a huge problem, like just uh, burning coal, coal all over again, basically. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you consider this at all so far? I'm not entirely sure. No, I, I haven't uh, thought about it that way. I mean, ultimately, we obviously release the energy that is contained in the material, as you said, right, mass. And in the very first step, that creates very fast particles. And if you think about it like that, this will ultimately create warmth. 
it heats up the inner wall. But then this is really in turn used to heat up steam, right? And ultimately that powers the turbine. So I'm not entirely sure where the heating of the atmosphere comes from. So from my basic understanding of physics, it will, the heat will stay there. If you convert mass to energy, it, it, the heat will be there, right? But what currently heats up the planet is the carbon dioxide right, that is yes. emitted to the atmosphere, I mean, right? And that in turn... I guess for a few decades it will be it, insignificant, yeah. but like if you're thinking of scaling the sample dot, I think it might be... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for the very interesting talk. A quick question regarding your key challenges in the engineering area. Can you comment on what the, let's say, top two or three and challenges are and how you want to overcome them? Yeah, sure. So as I said, I mean, for me, top of the game is really ultimately system integration, right? One is certainly developing these different technologies, and these will come now, but really then putting this all into a power plant that is highly reliable, runs almost 24-7, and contains hundreds of laser beams hitting the target flying in at the accuracy needed, and all of that will be a huge challenge. Uh, that's totally in front of us. The lasers, I'm very confident we can build them. We already have a design to build them and we will reach the efficiencies that are needed. Then again, building up the entire supply chain, building them reliably and integrating all of them is another challenge. But I would say the main challenge for us will be, or what we are currently thinking about, is producing these targets at the magnitude that we need to get high gain, at the cost that we need. It will be in the few cents per target that is actually required and to the accuracy that we need. This is something that we work a lot on internally, but also with partners, but that's certainly one of the key challenges. The last one I would say is the inner wall material. This is something that is very important. All of these particles hit the inner wall in some form or shape. We have the advantage that it's actually not neutrons, but alpha particles, and we can you know, guide them a little bit through magnetic fields and therefore you know, determine where they hit the wall and how fast. Um, but still, the material still needs to be further developed that can really withhold these lots of particles, the warmth that is created, um, and all that sort. Um, so these are, I would say, the, the main challenges. There is a number of further ones, of course, um, but this is, I would say, the, the main ones for us. For fusion in general, Tritium breeding is a key challenge. Um, this is you know, not our problem, but in general a problem. Tritium doesn't occur. There's roughly 12 kilograms on Earth. All of that is planned for ITER. Um, so only a few fission plants produce it, but they are actually ta taken out of service. So that whole tritium breeding cycle still needs to be developed and hasn't been tested. That's another big challenge. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, we do have a question from Slack, uh, from Ruslan, and he asks you uh, if you want to shoot on the targets from all directions in the future, um, did you think about spherical targets instead of subset grown targets? So, <clears throat> maybe two comments. Um, one is we won't shoot from all sides. Um, it will have a certain directionality. Um, the second more important one is the kind of simple illustration type of targets that I showed to you today are not the targets that will go into the power plant. Uh, there's obviously a more complex design behind that that we didn't reveal. Um, and there are all sorts of considerations there. You, you really need to think about even what we call the focusing dilemma. If you have hundreds of laser beams, they all need to go into the target chamber from a certain optic, so you need a lot of optics around the target chamber, and you can only make them so small because you have a certain damage threshold, um, and you still need some diagnostics, and you still need some room to actually convert energy. So there are all these sorts of considerations um, which make this a much more complex topic than uh, I could discuss today. Thanks. 
Okay, well, thanks for the cool talk. Well, one question. I'm following a bit uh, Marvel since quite a while. Uh, in the past, you had an approach where you have two particular lasers. Uh, one is for the heating the plasma and the other is for confining it. Why have you abandoned that approach? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so initially, or how Marvel was really born, we are a little bit different than most of the other fusion startups. Most of them are spin-outs of university. They have an approach that they spin out and they follow it. Marvel Fusion was really born with the commercial at its heart to find a fusion approach that makes commercially sense. So at the beginning, it was clear that we do lasers due to some of the reasons that we talked about, but we looked at the portfolio of approaches. And what you name there is proton fast ignition. It's something that we looked at in the beginning. It uses a picosecond laser, a nanosecond laser to compress the fuel, and then it uses a picosecond laser to accelerate protons and ignite the fuel. We did some initial experiments there, and we found out the efficiency is not high enough for what we think could be commercially relevant. And the second reason was that we saw that igniting PB11 will not be possible with this approach. So that's why we abandoned it. So thank you very much, Dan, again, for this talk. Um, and thank you all for attending and for the uh, live discussion. Thank you.